Over the next 19 days, 12 teams will compete at six various venues across the USA to decide who will be crowned CONCACAF's Gold Cup champions for 2007 and book a place at the 2009 Confederations Cup in South Africa. This show is titled Inside the Gold Cup, where through the tournament we will follow the trials and tribulations of all the teams and analyse the 25 games on display. And I'm in some very, very esteemed company. Yes, two generations of US internationals. First up, Mr. Shep Messing, graduated from Harvard University. University ship. You've uh, played goalkeeper for the US. You've played at the Cosmos with Pele and Beckenbauer. And I've been dying to ask you this: What's it like to play with uh, two international celebs like that? Uh, I'll tell you what, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest job in the world is when you go into goal and you look in front of you, and you have Pele, Franz Beckenbauer, Carlos Alberto, Giorgio Canaglia. All you have to do is get the ball to them, and you've got nothing to worry about. So <laughs> I, I felt like I was the luckiest goalkeeper in the world. Well, also joining us, former U.S. captain uh, John Harkes. Now, John, 90 games for the U.S. as captain, 150 in the MLS. And I knew you were one of the pioneers in the English Premier League, but I didn't know that you were the first person from the U.S. to play in the EPL. Uh, and you've also played in the Gold Cup. What was that experience like? Uh, tremendous experience, actually. I mean, uh, you know, trying to play a trade overseas was something that was unheard of at that time, I think, with Shep and I was able to witness as well, I was going to Giant Stadium every week, watching him play in goal with the Cosmos, and <laughs> I was a ball boy there for a short period of time. Uh, but that, you know, that stirs up the, the emotions as well, and, and that's what you want to do, and it worked out well for me. So uh, playing in the EPL was fantastic. Mm. Playing the Gold Cup was fantastic as well. Great exposure for the game in this country, not mm. just that, but also there's a sense of pride there, and when you represent your country and playing the Gold Cup, it, it's, you want to win it. Should I ask you about 93? Don't Mexico? go there. No. Azteca, <laughs> final. We lost to Mexico 4 0. I would have been tough there. I was out yes. of breath, mate. You know, it was just uh, it was a tough summer. Tough All right, summer. I'll, I won't wind up. Well, let's have a look at the Gold Cup for 2007. Yes, having a look at uh, the teams in this, uh, the ninth edition, uh, 12 teams are divided into three groups. And in Group A, we have Costa Rica, Haiti, Canada and Guadeloupe. And that starts in uh, Miami this evening. And Group B, which kicks off tomorrow at the Home Depot Centre, is the reigning Gold Cup champions, the USA, with the runners-up in the Caribbean Cup, Trinidad and Tobago, and the third and fourth place qualifiers from Central America, Guatemala and El Salvador. And finally in Group C, kicking off on Friday night at the Giants Stadium in New York, we have four-time Gold Cup champions Mexico with the Central Americans runners-up Panama and fifth place Honduras with the final spot going to the Caribbean's Cuba. Tell me, the Gold Cup in terms of for the CONCACAF teams, how important is it for the teams involved in this tournament? I think, Dennis, that the teams really take this tournament seriously. You listen to the newly appointed head coach of the U.S. national team, Bob Bradley. He talked about Gold Cup. That's a tournament that we have to win. So I think, John, mm. all the teams come in, especially some of the smaller nations, this is their opportunity to knock off the big boys and, and really <laughs> win Gold Cup. No, absolutely, and I agree with you, Chef. I think that not just that, there's such a transition going on with a lot of the national teams as well, whether it be coaches that were fired or new coaches coming on board. So they, they look at this in this transition of this is the tournament to win. This is the one to put the, set the stall out straight away, get the recognition for their team and their country, but also to help prepare and even qualify for the next World Cup. So they're looking to, you know, they want to put the wins on the board. This is very important. Well, I was listening to the uh, press conference the other night. Uh, President Jack Warner said there are no invitees, and if I have my way, there will be no guests at the future Gold Cup tournaments. And we've had teams like Brazil. Uh, we've also had uh, Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, South Korea, uh, also South Africa. In your thoughts, uh, do you think that's, that's a good thing? It's obviously so some development in CONCACAF where the tournament has gotten strong enough and the teams have gotten strong enough to be CONCACAF only. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. The teams have gotten so strong now that it can be all CONCACAF. I think it elevates the credibility of the tournament. I agree, and also it gives it a, a little bit of identity as well. And people, I think, are confused out there saying, you know, what, why is Colombia in this? Why is, you know, Brazil in this? And why, what's going on here? I mean... These are the teams in CONCACAF. This is what it's all about, and they want to, you know, it gives it its, its own identity, and they can carry on from there, and, and they can represent uh, CONCACAF very well. Well, John, as we mentioned, you played in uh, 93 and 96, and, and Shep, you've, you've followed it right from when it started in 91. How has it developed over the 16 years, the, the eight editions that we've had? Well, I think it's, uh, it's gone from strength to strength, really, not only just in terms of the le level and ability of each of the countries and the players that are being represented, um, and mind you, there is a lot more internationals now playing all over the world than there used to be. Uh, but also, just in terms of the exposure 
uh, it's, it's grown tremendously. And uh, I think a lot of people are not only viewing it, but dying to see these teams play. Well, uh, we mentioned that this is the first Gold Cup with no invitees. It's also the first Gold Cup for nine coaches with the respective teams that they're coaching. And we've got uh, names like Stephen Hart, Hernan Medford from Costa Rica, Carlos de los Cobos, uh, Roger Salnot, Hernan Gomez, uh, just to name a few. Also, Bob Bradley uh, from the US, Gimedeas with Panama. Uh, it's just, it's a real melting pot of coaches that all want to uh, make a good first impression. Well, I think it's all about transition. You look at Hugo Sanchez from Mexico as well. It, it's about where you are as a national team coach in terms of how important this tournament is. If you have a long-term contract, okay. If you get knocked out of Gold <laughs> Cup, it's not the end now, of the world. Now, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to get into coaching a, a little bit later, but uh, for, from a coaching perspective, how hard is it to man-manage? Well, John's now a coach, so he can answer that best. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think Bruce, agree will dis Bruce Arena will disagree with you. We're all not coaches until we're fired. That's when you become a coach. But, uh, you know, man-managing, I think that's really what it comes down to. At the national team level, it's completely different than being in a club environment. You know, club environment is a day-to-day -day process. National team, you only get in the team for certain periods of time throughout the year. Um, so it is strictly man management. It's selection of players, putting them together, and trying to build the best chemistry that you can um, at that particular time. When you're doing a club environment, it's more or less every single day. And you know what it's like, Shep. You know you're doing the process. You can change formations, 3-5-2, 4-4-2, because of injuries. When it comes to national teams, a coach puts a stamp on that team. This is mm. how we're going to play, play, these are my strengths, and this is what we're going forward with. And that's, he lives or dies by that. And John knows it well. When you play in a tournament like Gold Cup or any big international tournament, for the coaches, for the players, it's all about let's get out of group play. Let's get out of group play, whatever it is, to get into the knockout phase. That's what these coaches are focused on. All right, when we come back, we go through the nitty-gritty of Group A involved in this year's Gold Cup tournament. Gatorade Sports Science Institute. We test athletes in the lab. Because we know they'll be tested on the field. Gatorade, the most tested sports drink on the planet. Work like a pro. Play like a pro. Tackle tough jobs. Dominate the game. Destroy the competition. Go professional. Choose Makita. Welcome back to Inside the Gold Cup as we review the teams in Group A. Yes, Group A consists of Costa Rica, Canada, Haiti and a little Guadeloupe. And Shep, it would be fair to say that the Costa Ricans go in as favourites of this group. Well, if you say so, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to put my neck out on the line and say they're going to take it. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. Clearly, Costa Rica, one of the better teams in the tournament. But I do think they're a team that's a little bit in transition. No more Palo Ancho. This is a team that's uh, changed from the last two World Cups. Absolutely, and changed in many ways, not just the players, but also in terms of the coach. And Hernan Medford, he's his first time stepping in there. No Central American team has won this tournament beforehand. He wants to put his stamp on there now as a coach, so you know maybe he's got some great ideas, big ideas, to win this tournament. Well, plenty of talent in this Costa Rican side, uh, with nine players featuring from Deportivo Saprissa. One of those uh, is their goalkeeper, Porras. However, two to keep an eye on uh, are the stars of the Club World Cup for Saprissa in 2005, Christian Volanos and Walter Centeno, a lethal combination. Well, I, I love the player Centeno because I think it really all is about that guy in the middle of the field, that general who can be the catalyst, make the transition from defense into the attacking third of the field. Absolutely. I agree with that. And I think that, you know, 
you've got to have somebody holding him behind him to make sure, you know, that that everything he has is that freedom to go and play. <laughs> but at the same time, you've got to talk about scoring goals. And when you look at his system, you know, Medford, he wants to play a 3-5-2. He needs that Fonseca to really come out and shine in this tournament. He has 46 goals, really, for the, uh, for the team itself. And uh, hopefully he gets on the score sheet as well up front. Traditionally, guys, you play, you've played against Costa Rica somewhere in uh, some type of qualifying tournament. What do they like to play against? Well, right. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, are they, it, they are? How, why? It, it's very difficult, <laughs> and, and Shep will agree, is uh, when you're playing in Saprissa um, in the stadium, uh, the atmosphere that's created there is, is very hectic, and uh, it's very hard to even hear yourself speak, so the communication breaks down, number one. Uh, the high pressure that they play as well makes it very, very difficult to get yourself into a rhythm of the play. Yeah, John know. makes mm. a great point because technically they're very gifted players. Uh, for the 90 minutes, they will play high pressure and take you out of your rhythm. So they have, they have the strength and the organization to defend. They have the skill and the work rate in the midfield, and they have guys up top who could finish. Well, also in Group A, uh, Canada, and I just can't believe that fairy tale story I was reading about in 2000, where they won the tournament on the toss of a coin. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have that? <laughs> we need that coin, I think, you know, if we could... Uh... Maybe have a lucky coin there, but you know Canada's a strong, strong side, and uh, you know they, they they're going through a transition as well. Stephen Hart, he's only going to be there for this particular tournament, and then Dale Mitchell will take over as the head coach after the U20 World Championships, Youth World Championships, that is. But well, talk about the players, though, Chef. I mean, they're, they're, you know, who's your favorite? Well, I, you, you know, I, I, I'm not saying Dwayne <laughs> Di Rosario. I love Staltari. I mean, he he starred for Werder Bremen in the Bundesliga for years. He's with Tottenham now. So Stelteri is great. De Rosario is great. I love the fact that Steve Nash, the basketball player, has a brother on this team, Martin Nash. He plays. Absolutely, yeah. But the if, they're, if they're question marks, John, I think a question mark might be in goal. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question mark, really, uh, for Stephen Hart. I mean, who do you start in goal? Because, really, uh, Pat Onstead, who plays for the Houston Dynamo Major League Soccer, has been the starting goalkeeper for years. And uh, now you've got Greg Sutton, who's playing at Toronto FC under Mo Johnson. Um, he's gotten really more of the, the confidence booster, I think, from the coach. But on the day, you know, Pat Onstead gets called in late. Is he going to mm. be the next uh, decision? Maybe they swap that at the last minute. It is a test, of course. Uh, they face Costa Rica first. What, what a test. Uh, apparently in head-to-head, uh, -head, exactly equal in the Gold Cup. Well, I mean, I don't know in terms of their ability and their style of play is completely different. Maybe in terms of the stats, which I'm not mm. a stat guy, Dennis. Oh, That's right. what you're here for. But, well, hey, my my you know, surname's Kat Samos, but they call me Stat Samos back Canada home. So, hey. a, yeah, Canada's <laughs> a hard-working team, all right? Uh, they're organized, uh, a little bit more organized than what they were in the past. I think a lot of that has to do with Frank Yallop, who was uh, managing the side for a period of time. Um, after, you know, last year he walked away from that, and now he's manager of LA Galaxy. But... You know, look, this, this team, they've got to work very hard to really shut down the Costa Rican Ticos. Ticos are going to come out and play very explosive soccer. Yeah, John and I both shook our head when you started going with stats. We don't uh, want to hear about oh, stats. Yeah, right, right. It's all about <laughs> contrasting styles, but they're not the only two teams well, in the group. At uh, 94th in the world, were you surprised that, that Canada pulled off a draw against Venezuela in a friendly a couple of days ago? Not surprised, really, when you got a no. guy like Di Rosario who can put the ball in the back of the net. And mm. he's, he hasn't been really on fire or in form, really, for the Houston Dynamo at all. Uh, but he's showing that he can score on the international stage, so hopefully that he does that again in their first match against the Ticos. Well, when you talk about uh, dark horses, one of the dark horses that could upset both Canada and also Costa Rica is uh, Haiti Chip. Well, you know, I love the passion in <laughs> Gold Cup because this Haitian team, uh, when they land here to play, they have a passionate crowd mm. behind them. So that's going to spur them on. We get a look at their lineup. They have oh, some talented individual players. He's at Nantes uh, for France, and he really uh, held the back well in that uh, Caribbean Cup final. Uh, pretty much uh, the reason why Trinidad and Tobago could only score one past them. Also, uh, Jermaine, an absolute uh, workhorse in the midfield, and Busico uh, scored in that final, and also Fusian, uh, fantastic playmakers. Just They've got that... Um, that Island uh, just creativity where you I don't even think they're quite sure what they're going to do with the ball when they get it Well, they have, I don't they know have if so many individuals you know and uh, Shep and I were talking about this as well about how the individuals it, It's really important that they come together But I think the key there and when you talk about the individuals and how they're kind of all over the place They need the discipline But they do need Jermaine to really hold down that central midfield position and be disciplined and, and spray that ball around and do the workhorse that he always does and provide that. If he doesn't have that, that structure and that backbone right down the middle of the field, then I think they're going to be in trouble. See, I, I love the way he talks because he was such a good two-way <laughs> player. I talk about the attacking playmaker, and right again, John's 
pointing out the guy more important, the guy who sits back a little bit deeper, keeps things organized, wins the ball, sprays it around. That was John Harks. I don't know if Haiti has a John Harks on their team. <laughs> John, do you, do you think it's a, an unglamorous role to play that role? Do you sometimes feel like, hey, man, everyone's talking about the goal scorers and stuff, but they wouldn't get the ball if I hadn't fought hard in the midfield for it? You know, I, I don't actually. I don't. I don't think it's a problem really because people who really know football are going to see where where it comes from, where the strengths of its side come from, and hopefully, when you're playing that role and whatever it may be, whether it be a central back position, who I think nowadays, especially in the Dutch system, the two center backs are really the playmakers. Right. But you know, if you see that in the central midfield position and a guy who's holding defensively, now he can be the star, but he can be the star in different ways. He's just got to provide that balance and that structure and uh, you know win the balls. Well, Haiti are off to the uh, under-17 World Cup. They're also Caribbean and champions in under 20s so looking at this trend um, it, it, the future's looking bright well I think it does look bright but one of the things we were talking about before is that <coughs> confidence you know breeds with mm. success they need some wins they need some successes then they can build on that and so I think they're coming into this gold cup tournament fired up they need a result mm. and, and it's a uh, uh, one thing that I really think that's fantastic is it's, it's quite a poor nation, a, a country like Haiti, so when some young guys are, are quite talented in football, it's a good opportunity for them to get out and earn some money. And, uh, you know, a, a bit like um, uh, De La Cruz uh, from Ecuador, you know, he came from a poor background, put some money in um, back, back to the society he grew up in. Absolutely, and I think that, you know, this is what it's all about, this type of tournament, is the exposure. And uh, these players as well, they know when they're playing for the national sides, they are going to be seen, and uh, is their chance to shine. So hopefully <coughs> they get more opportunities from those results that they have. And this is what, you know, Shep was saying, they've got to get the results. They've got to play well and then try to get some results, and they'll get more recognition and self-belief. While also making uh, their first Gold Cup appearance with a population of 400,000, Guadeloupe. Uh, and, of course, they're a department of France, and uh, Jocelyn Anglomar, at 41 years old, uh, there's hope for you yet, John. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're making a comeback. Well, it's I'll the rumours. I'll only make a comeback at 40 if Shep is my manager. If he, if he can tra train me. I thought you were going to say your goalkeeper. No. <laughs> this is a great experience, and this is a great situation for Guadeloupe, as you say. You know, first time representing here, and they've got a they've got an opportunity maybe to be that dark horse mm. that you talked about earlier. Well, when it comes to scoring goals, uh, Mocha just sensational in qualifying, and also Radas. Uh, they're just uh, two guys, lightning quick, and uh, typically of Caribbean nations, uh, if you fall asleep a little bit, they catch you on the counter attack and just wallop you. Well, I think they're your Cinderella team, Dennis. Of the I, I, you love Guadeloupe. I, I do. And, and the other thing is, uh, being a French department, I'm not sure. I've have, have to check the ruling on this, but I think uh, guys that were born there, like uh, Turam or Chimbonda or something like that, uh, if they want to come back one day and play, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm under the understanding, and I'm happy to be wrong, but I'm under the understanding that they, anyone from France, could come back and play for them, just like Anglomar, who's had. Uh, 37 games for the I, French international uh, there, side. There's many players that have actually represented, and they're all from those areas as well. And they've, they've played for France. Sylvain Wiltord is another player as well. But uh, I'm going to have to disagree. I don't think they can go back and play. It's almost okay. like Chris Arm is <laughs> playing for Puerto Rico, although he all was right. able to play for the yeah. U.S. But let's not go there. Yeah, yet. I couldn't get an official <laughs> ruling, so I, you know I might get the, you know get in trouble for that. But yeah. um, also with uh, Coach Roger Sell not there from uh, 2001, plenty of stability in the side. Well, I, the one thing I really question, though, is where are the goals going to come from and can they stay organized on the defensive side of the, of, of the ball? You're talking about a group play where, you know, they have some tough competition. So you, you always need two things in the midfield. I don't know if Guadalupe has it. You need mm. ball winners and you need playmakers. So uh, let's see how they do in the first game. Now, a lot of these boys uh, do play in France, so that European experience, it can't be a bad thing at all for them. No, absolutely not. No, I think it's good for them. I mean, the one thing you got to worry about as well, are they, are they burnt out from their season? Right. Are they going to be able to recover quickly and mm -hmm. then obviously sit, you know, fit into a system that you know, the head coach wants them to do? And it's, that's difficult and it's very hard. That whole transition of like you've had two or three weeks off now from the season, now you've got to recharge your batteries, get back into it. Mm -hmm. the, traditionally, uh, playing Caribbean sides, uh, what does it feel like for you guys, especially when you've got to go to the islands? I know this, the Gold Cup's here, but uh, what is it like playing the know. Soka Warriors or you know Guadeloupe? Or it, it's you never know what's going to happen. They're so unorthodox in their style of play that they could you know score goals from anywhere or be dangerous at any point in the game. But also their lack of discipline, they could just you know crumble at any time. So it could be the floodgates. Could be four 0 Loss, or it could be a 1-0 win. Yeah, John's you know. absolutely right, because it's a two-edged sword, and you, and you don't know what you're getting, so it's difficult to prepare. It really is. You can't scheme against a team like that. They can come out and be explosive. They, they usually have speed and, and try and play the width of the field, get behind your back line. 
or if you if you punish them, if you get a goal or two, it could be all over. So, yeah. it, it, difficult challenge. Well, upon our return, we have a look at Group B from the 2007 Gold Cup. Work like a pro. Play like a pro. Tackle tough jobs. Dominate the game. Destroy the competition. Go professional. Choose Makita. At the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, we test athletes in the lab. Because we know they'll be tested on the field. Gatorade, the most tested sports drink on the planet. Welcome back to Inside the Gold Cup, your one-stop shop when it comes to the tournament. And let's have a little looky at Group B. Well, Group B consists of the USA, El Salvador, Guatemala and Trinidad and Tobago. And fair to say, if history repeats, the US, they're going to take this out. They have won every single group match they've ever played in. 18-0, 16 years worth of wins. Well, I'm going to defer to the captain <laughs> of the American team for so many years. Let, let John get started. Well, I think that, you know, when you look at the U.S. side, first of all, you've got some returning players coming back, you know, and a lot of experience, I think, in this type of tournament is very important. Um, when mm -hmm. you look at the whole transition stage, you're talking about Bob Bradley. Now, he's done a very good job in terms of preparation. I think, you know, he was the interim coach. Uh, the U.S. finally decided Sunil Gulati uh, has made his decision. Now, Bob Bradley is the man leading this team forward. Mm -hmm. You know, four wins and one draw going into this game as a first-time coach isn't such a bad preparation. So I think they've got the key players coming back. Timmy Howard, number one, is a goalkeeper who takes over from Casey Keller and Brad Friedel the past, who have done very well in goal. And I think oh. goalkeeping and defending has been a very big highlight for the U.S. so far in terms of being successful in this, this Gold Cup. Well, if, uh, if we have a look at this team, who would you say are, are the keys to this American side? Well, you know... <laughs> Don't know where to start. John started in the back, and that's a great place to start because maybe this is the passing of the mantle. Tim Howard really resurrected his career. Spectacular at Manchester United. Now at Everton, he's the man. Casey Keller maybe passing the mantle to Tim Howard. But then when you talk about the U.S. national team, John, and Dennis, I think you've got to talk <laughs> about attacking players like Landon Donovan, Eddie Johnson. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, Landon Donovan, we know him so well. He's one of the best players in the U.S. that they've produced in terms of attacking style. Very creative, quick, great speed to get in, beautiful runs off the ball as well. Uh, he's a player that needs supplying through the midfield. And I'm going to go back to it again, Chef, but <laughs> Claudio Reyna you know, is not in the midfield anymore. Yep. The captain's mm -hmm. gone. Who's going to take over that spot? Maybe his son, Michael Bradley, who's been given more of a shot and opportunity since he's been in Holland playing in uh, Harravine. He's gotten more experience. He's a better player. Uh, is he going to share that responsibility uh, with maybe a uh, uh, Benny Fieldhopper who scored in the game against China 4-1, one of the goal scorers. Clint Dempsey's in there. Will he drift Love inside? Him. Will he stay out in the wing? There's so many different things that Bob Bradley can do with this side, but they are an attacking force. I definitely believe that. Now, with 11 players uh, playing over in Europe, how do you feel personally, uh, John, that you were the first and now... Uh, how many hundreds of Americans are playing overseas? Well, I mean, I think my story is a boring story. Let's put that to bed anyway. Um, you, many, you must many feel, moons you ago, must feel I went a sense of pride, though. You must. Oh, absolutely. You always do. Um, you know, whether you're representing the U.S. with the uni uniform on, uh, the jersey, or you're representing the U.S. by playing for a club overseas, it's very important. You take a lot of pride in that. So, yeah, it was a great opening. And I think, you know, nowadays you look at the players getting opportunities overseas is tremendous. And, uh, you know, I, it's great to have those doors open, and now those players got to make the best with all those opportunities that they're getting. If they don't, then it's a waste of their talent and those chances, you know. Yeah, John talked before, Dennis, about the transition. You know, you're playing for your club in Europe. You come back now and play in the Gold Cup. Uh, I want to point out that there's some pressure on this USA team. This Gold Cup is in, a, in the United States. It's a home 
Domain. They're a heavy favorite. They still have to get the job done. And, and it's not easy when they're going to play some teams that are going to pack it in, sit behind the ball, and the U.S. is going to have to try and break them down. And let's not forget, you know, Shep, they didn't breeze through this tournament. They're right. defending champions, which won in penalty kicks. So it mm. was difficult, too, in terms of being the champions there. The defending champs, there is more pressure on them. Speaking of at home, for an outsider like myself, this Home Depot Center or this Home Depot Stadium, what's it like to play there? Ah, it's it's uh, a fantastic situation. I think, you know, when you talk about the U.S. and you talk about the success of Major League Soccer, number one, you want individual stadiums built throughout the clubs and uh, throughout the country for the clubs. And now you have the Home Depot Center, which is a perfect place to play for the national team. Although, I will say <laughs> that we need one on the East Coast. Something that's going to be better for the European teams to come over. The U.S. Soccer Federation. Sunil, if you're watching, get your money out. Uh, we need to have that. But it is a great place to play. Great atmosphere there. And I think, you know, that, that, that's something that can be used maybe as a home advantage. You, you know, one of the things I love being on, on, on a show oh, with John Hart, <laughs> a signature player, one of the greatest players ever for this country, who spent a career trying to figure out how to break curfew. Now he's an assistant <laughs> coach. He's the guy that has to knock on the door and make sure the guys are in. But yeah. do, do look, all the that? venues are good. Never knock on the door. Do, you don't? Never. Tell me, what if you catch guys? Are they in trouble or are you, you're quite lenient on it? Well, or what's the sort of situation with uh, curfews and stuff? First of all, Dennis, you never want to get to that point. If the players mm. are, are trying to skip curfews and they're breaking curfews, especially with the modern game and how fast and physical and how much fitness is involved in the game as well. Let's not take away the technical side. Speed of thought is very important, but if the players are willing to take that chance and they don't belong there in the first place. And if they do it maybe once or twice, yeah, everybody <laughs> makes up, uh, messes up, you make mistakes. But as a coach, I mean, you're there to you know, help them become better and, okay. and to learn what's right and what's wrong. And we're joking about it, but really for this mm. U.S. team we've been talking about, John, you know, this is an opportunity some, for some of the players to really stamp their name and say, hey, Bob Bradley, you know, I want to be with you for the next four years. So very Im important games coming up. Well, also in this group, uh, uh, Guatemala, they've played in seven tournaments. Uh, haven't had the best of success, but uh, hoping to, to go a step better this tournament. Uh, you know, listen, I don't know how John feels about it, but they have one player who's a mercury rod for criticism and, and for people patting them on the back. So Carlos Ruiz, I mean, he's a handful. He absolutely is, Shep, and uh, he's a handful in many ways. I think he's a handful <laughs> on the field and off. I mean, coaches really have had, you know, their own problems in terms of discipline, making sure that he shows up for training on time, and he's been mm. suspended, you know, at FC Dallas by Steve Morrow, who is a, oh. an ex-Arsenal uh, player as well. So these things, they come into play. Is he going to show up? Which Carlos Ruiz is going to be <laughs> there? The player that holds the ball up very well, is strong up front, who's got a good little, you know, turn on the ball, can shoot from anywhere in distance, can take it out of the air acrobatically, or the Carlos Ruiz who might not be involved in the game, gets a kick and then maybe doesn't show up. I and mean, that's a difficult decision. Well, if we look at the squad, uh, if anyone can develop this team of players, uh, it is Gomez. Uh, he's just done a sensational job with Ecuador. I remember never heard of them until the 2002 World Cup, and look what they achieved in 2006. Uh, he's just a phenomenal coach. Yeah, he is, and he's, 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 uh, he's a coach that has a good personality as well. Mm. I think he has a good balance within the side. And Although, I mean, I haven't said that, they do need the discipline and they need other things that they've been lacking for years. I think Guatemala, whenever we played against them, we're always thinking as a U.S. side, we can beat Guatemala. One, they're good in possession, but they really don't hurt anybody. So, and I think the one way they can is maybe through Ruiz. I don't know. How can a coach uh, like him take the limited resources of, of a small nation like Guatemala and achieve so much with the players? Well, I think, you know, John just alluded to it, that, you know, tactics and organization mm. works wonders. So if he's got Melgar on the back, if he can stay in packed, keep 10 guys behind the ball, look to counterattack through the likes of Carlos Ruiz, I, I think then he's got an opportunity. If mm. he plays a wide open game for 90 minutes, I don't think he has a chance. Well, they made the semis in 96. Uh, how have they developed in that 10-year in that period as a side? They've been up and down like a roller coaster. Yeah. They've mm. had some good results, and then they've had some really poor results. And uh, I think that in inconsistency is not good going into the Cup as well. Well, they haven't uh, had a warm-up match for, I don't know, since March or something. How will that affect them? Will they be a little bit rusty going out onto the field? Well, again, we've talked about uh, motivation and, and levels the teams are, are at when this tournament Gold Cup is ready to start. I think for Guatemala, any success they have is tremendous. So, you know, it's David and Goliath. Uh, I, you know, rusty, you could look at it that way. <laughs> the other way is invigorated. They can't wait to get on the field and play. Well, fair enough. Uh, also uh, in this group is El Salvador. Now, they picked up uh, fourth spot in UNCAF. 
They've been struggling for a little bit of form. From what I read, they lost their, they've lost their last five matches, and they are all to teams involved in this gold card. Yeah, and that's not good. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Very simply stated, we're playing yeah. the obvious game here. We all win. <laughs> but, uh, no, they've had some struggles. And, uh, you know, you, you look at some of the players that are in the system there, uh, not many players stand out as individually technically gifted players. Uh, they're a team that will graft for you. They'll dig in. Um, whether or not they can do that for a full 90 minutes, I think that's what, what's really hurt them. And, you know, the, you talk about defending, you talk about scoring goals. Ronald Cerritos is on the team. He used to play in the Major League Soccer as well. Shep, you know him very well. Um, he's been a good goal scorer at San Jose. I mean, but uh, uh, having said that, I mean, for the national side, all these players are playing in, Sal Sa in mm. El Salvador. Um, and do they need more international experience to be within this national team? I think so. Well, you've got the defensive duties uh, for Pacheco there. Uh, also up front uh, with Cerritos is uh, Campos. And uh, from all accounts, everything that I've managed to be able to read about him, uh, he's, he's a very talented player. Well, Dennis, we've talked about it before. Again, in terms of tactics and with the players they have all playing at home in El Salvador, Campos, I think, is a player they can look to counterattack through, sit mm. back, stay organized, but do they, do they have the discipline to do it? John and I have talked about it before. We've both played down there against El Salvador in San Salvador. That's a tough nut to crack, but now they're away from home. They're playing in a big tournament. They're up against real good teams. We have to see how it goes. I think well, they'll struggle. Yeah? Yes. Ah, so finally, someone puts their head on the chopping block. No, you I, I think, think they'll struggle. Very, hey, doesn't want to get out there. I really do. I think they'll struggle, <laughs> and I know it's not like, oh, it's easy to say that because of the preparation work, mm. but I just think over time, um, you have seen that, you know, when they've played in big tournaments or whatever, they haven't really yeah. come up, you know, very strong at all. Well, last but not least, uh, is the best of the Caribbean sides, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, they've had a, a phenomenal success. I, how, I don't know how you felt, but it was fantastic seeing them at the 2006 World Cup, 1.1 million people, and they managed to nick a point. Oh, they did very well, actually. And uh, if you look back on the World Cup and you talk about Trinidad and Tobago, you got a guy like they actually brought back Dwight York, and I think Love that's it. pretty fantastic. I mean, for a manager, it sometimes says, like, oh, he's a player, he's older, and, you know, he's done, he's washed up, let him go. He actually put himself on the line, the, the head coach, and he said, let's bring him back into the fold. But... Drop him into a deeper position, Shep, and yeah, this is the yeah. thing. He was an attacking goal scorer for many years in the EPL and also representing his country. And now he becomes like a playmaker from a deep position in the midfield, and I thought they did very well. The other thing was in the, in the first game when they got a man sent off, they think that you know, coaches would be negative and say, let's put on another defender in the, in the World <laughs> Cup. They actually put a striker on. <laughs> and because they, they need somebody to play up to. That's positive thinking, and I love that in a manager. Well, in terms of players, of course, uh, no Dwight York. Uh, he retired earlier this year to help out Sunderland, uh, his team uh, there with uh, Roy Keane. But uh, in goalkeeping duties is Jean-Michael uh, Williams, and uh, he is uh, their number one starter. Also, Silvio Spahn, he controls the midfield. And the man I like, uh, Gary Glasgow up front, and he picked up uh, six goals in the Caribbean Cup in five games, which is a, a pretty good effort. Yeah, Glasgow's a good player. They have some talented individuals. I'm missing is the player that John talked about with the red card in Germany, A.V. John. But, yep. you, you know, great story at the World Cup. Can they do it again? I had the opportunity to speak to uh, their head coach, who was a teammate of mine, Reisberger, on the Cosmos. And he, he loves the talent on the team. He really does. He just, again, it's a function of can I get, get us all on the same page? Can we stay disciplined at the back? He wants them, John and Dennis, to have that creativity when they get forward. But really, you know, in their own half of the field, he's insisting on organization. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's always been a hard player, Wim, Wim Reisbergen. Um, and uh, maybe he sees uh, the success that they had in the World Cup, and he's trying to carry that on throughout into the Gold Cup here now. Um, but having said that, uh, he's always been a very good defensive stalwart. <laughs> so hopefully he brings that. What he, what, you know, that, that talent that he had as a defensive player himself into this island side because they're all over the place too. They really are. <laughs> well, last but not least, we preview Group C when we return. At the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, we test athletes in the lab. Because we know they'll be tested on the field. Gatorade. 
the most tested sports drink on the planet. Work like a pro. Play like a pro. Tackle tough jobs. Dominate the game. Destroy the competition. Go professional. Choose Makita. Welcome back to Inside the Gold Cup, where we turn our attention to Group C. We have Mexico, Panama, Honduras, and also Cuba. Now, Sanchez has come out in the papers and he said, look, I just want to beat the U.S. He's not even worried about uh, the three, four, five <laughs> games that he has to play before. Should he be focusing about, uh, you know, the, the round-robin group play first? Uh, he's, he's playing <laughs> games, Hugo Sanchez. He's taking it personal, um, mm, which very is great. Much. Um, having the chance to play against him, I think he's a fantastic player and a striker that uh, really can't be matched for a long period of time in Mexico. But hopefully he's got these players behind him and his system, his beliefs, his passion that's coming across onto the pitch, and hopefully they can do this. I think really, and I might put this out there, but and Bob Bradley might not be happy, Mexico for me could be the team that wins this tournament. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> first, of all, first of all, John is absolutely right when it comes to Hugo Sanchez. He knows exactly what he's saying psychologically, motivationally for his team. He knows that he can't look past getting out of the first group, but he's got his eye on the Gold Cup championship. He's, he's dead set to get it. I think he's got arguably the best team in the tournament, but he's still got to go out and do it. All right, speaking of his team, let's have a look at them. Uh, one word for Mexico, and that's uh, star-studded. Well, <laughs> there's no question. I mean, a highlighted player from Barcelona, he's injured right now, but Mexico is expecting that if they make it to the semifinals, Marquez will be available to play. Well, you've got um, himself, Blanco, of course, Castillo, who plays uh, at Olympiacos in Greece. He's won the championship with them. Uh, one of my favorites. I really, really enjoy watching this guy, Borghetti. Well, I'll throw it a job because both of us were on the defensive side of the ball. Mm. I'll tell you what, both <laughs> Blanco and Borghetti, that's a handful. And whoever's playing against them, uh, that's a challenge. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you talk about matchups. You know, you look at Borghetti, you look at these players up top. Not only are they quick and agile, but they're big and strong. Right. So, I mean, you've got to be able to match them in market up on not only the run of play but also the set plays which are going to be so important and I think really the momentum is with this team I mean the belief is there um, not only are they getting goals in, in their last match they beat Iran 4-0 four, four but they're getting goals from different players yeah. and whether it be from the midfield from the strikers from the outside guys overlapping they're producing very good football very good fluid football coming forward and they are a team to be reckoned with. Yeah, John, I mean, John's right, and especially when he talks about the physicality of mm. the players. I mean, Borghetti, a great player in the air. So they have the skill on the ball. They're good in the air. Blanco's an interesting story, too, because he has signed to play with the Chicago Fire in Major League Soccer. He could actually, if Mexico goes to the finals of Gold Cup, be playing the semifinals in Chicago, the finals in Chicago, and then go to his new team, the Chicago Fire. Yep. Of course, the U.S. Uh, have played Mexico a number of times. They beat them in a friendly earlier on uh, this year, 2-0. Will they be taking much into that, say, the, picking the favourites, that the U.S. does end up playing Mexico in the final? Will that have much uh, bearing on the final? It's a totally different <laughs> ball game. <and> it gets, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah, it will. Absolutely. So you think yeah. they'll be out for a bit of vengeance? Oh, uh, the all Mexicans. the time. I mean, the rivalry between these two nations, I mean, has gone past, <laughs> you know, past chef's years. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, no, no disrespect there. Um, and he knows that there's, uh, you know, it's just been something that's constant. Uh, it's, it's uh, at times there's been players individually who have had quotes in the paper saying that they can't stand, they hate these other players, and yeah. uh, whether it be Mexico or U.S. And so this battle's there, and it's, it's a fantastic match. It's a really good game to see. I mean, when you talk about old firm derbies and everything right. else from a national point of view, Mexico against the U.S., it's brilliant, and it's, it, it brings so much to the table. Now, I know there's a, a massive Latino um, uh, population here in America. Home Depot Center, say the U.S., um, oh, sorry, Soldier Field, I should say, in Chicago, say the U.S. is playing Mexico there. Um, would the U.S. fans be outnumbered like in other venues around the States, or is it a little bit more even there? Forgive, my, uh, forgive me for not knowing, but... 
he's, he's new to the United States. I've yeah, been, been here about a week. So, <laughs> well, well let, let's just say this. Let's go back and, and talk about one of the other games, the U.S. against Haiti, when they're playing in Miami. You mm. know, and, and there's 50,000 Haitians there, and the U.S. wins 3-0. <laughs> so, yeah, it, 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 it's going to be like that in the Mexican situation as well. I mean, they're, they're, they're a fantastic team to watch, Mexico, actually. As much as I sometimes hate to say that, being an ex-U.S. national team player, uh, they really are. And their supporters are all over the country in America. So, yeah, it's going to be kind of split, and that's why whenever the U.S. has to qualify against them for major mm. tournaments like the World Cup, uh, we try to play in mm. really a, a kind of a home situation like Columbus, Midwest, somewhere like yeah. that. Now, Mexico have got the best record in the Gold Cup. They've won it four times. But the thing that really impressed me when I was uh, studying them is that they've won two of those, two of those tournaments without conceding a single goal. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. But, but what, back to what John was speaking about, this is not, you can't manufacture rivalries. I mean, Mexico, USA, that's a rivalry that's, it's taken its own form. It's off the charts. I caution everybody, though. You know, Mexico, I agree with John, great team, USA, very deep, very talented. This Gold Cup competition, you know, there are bumps along the way. I'm not all that sure that they're going to both find their way to the final. Now, I know Bob Bradley's come out and said that the Gold Cup is the focus, uh, not the Copa America. For the Mexicans, would it be the same, or are they sort of more interested in playing in that tournament? No, I think, look, you know, Hugo Sanchez, and you said it yourself at the top of the, uh, mm. the, 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 the show here, you were saying that, look, you know, he wants to come out and he wants to beat U.S. It's like uh, really and he wants to win this tournament, and, and what Shep said too is, you know, he wants to win everything, Hugo. You never want to lose as a national team coach, and especially the coaches that have gone through the national teams of Mexico. I mean, <laughs> I've been there and, uh, where we've qualified against uh, Mexico in the World Cup qualifier in uh, Azteca Stadium where they've actually been booing Borla Militinovic. Right. And they were asking Ooh. for him to be fired in that game because we drew nil-nil. No way. And that's a result for us away from home. <laughs> it's so tough to play in that situation, in that environment. Uh, so, yeah, he wants to win. He wants to come out here. He wants to... His team to not only just win games, but to win them in a flavor and a fashion <laughs> yeah, that shoves he, it in your face. It's like, he, from what I was reading, and that's just my interpretation, it is like he's a man possessed. But another finalist uh, that is in this group is Honduras and traditionally a lightning quick side. Well, you, you got to talk about one guy when you talk. I'm focused on, we focused on Carlos Ruiz when we were talking about mm -hmm. Guatemala. Uh, John knows this guy better than er anybody. I mean, Amado Guevara. So up and down. Yeah, I mean, and again, Shep, you know, he was a player that we'll talk about him in Major League Soccer. He was with the Metro Stars. Um, he moved from Metro Stars uh, to Chivas and then obviously going back to now playing Honduras again. So there's been a lot of transition for him. Will he be a settled player in this tournament? In the last game in, uh, in the friendly, the, he came out in the 60th minute. Is he a player that can play full 90 minutes? Can he be relied upon? And I think that's been what something that you're touching upon right now, Shep, is that He's been kind of inconsistent in his play, and that led to his really his transferring from the Metro Stars, now the New York Red Bulls, which we're, I'm coaching at now, to Chivas USA in mm. Major League Soccer. So he's an inconsistent player. Can he play off, pull off some plays? Absolutely. Can he be a guy that can make a difference in the game? Yeah, but again, who's going to show up? All right, well, let's have a look at this uh, Honduras side. And again, another side with uh, tons and tons of talent. Uh, Renato Ruedas has done a, a fantastic job for them. Uh, Ivan Guerrero, now that's uh, one name I know synonymous here with the States, um, but might be aging on a little bit. Well, I, I'm not sure how much uh, Guerrero will contribute, but I think a player to look at is Pavon mm. up front. And, and again, tactically, uh, John and Dennis, the way I think Honduras will play, I don't think they're going to gamble. I don't think they're going to venture everything forward. If they have Pavon, they have Amado Guevara on his game as that transition player, you know, win the ball, get it to Amado, let him try and create, I think they could be dangerous. Now, they've been uh, struggling a little bit of late, uh, and, and they haven't played much football. I know I've touched on this uh, with you a little bit, but again, another sign uh, that might, might not be up to scratch when it comes to uh, kicking off in the Gold Cup. No, absolutely not. I think they're, they're poor starters, and not only that, I think, you know, in order to be successful in the Gold Cup, and we've seen in the past, that you've got to start strong. You've got to get the results, and, of course, you've got to get through on a group play, and Shep already talked about that. So this is a side who has always struggled with that. I think, again, like I said about El Salvador in the last group, I think Honduras is going to struggle in this group as well. Well, another one of my dark horses. I'm, I'm happy to put my neck out on the line here. Another one of my dark horses in this tournament uh, has to be Panama now. I don't know about you guys, but uh, they have shot up 20 places in world rankings in the last few months. So what do you think has contributed to that? 
Well, Dennis, you know less about soccer than both of us. So. <laughs> no, so the, the reason I say that is, is we, you know, we don't get to see a lot of um, you know, Central American or CONCACAF football. So um, when you when you see information like that, like Panama's just shot through the rankings, uh, you wonder, could it be uh, Gimaraes, their coach? Uh, could it be they've got a national development plan? Is there a goal project going on? Or or have they uh, just, has football just taken off? Yeah, it, it could be uh, the coach. And, and where was he coaching before? Uh, Costa Rica. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, you know, we talk about that. But it also could be the money that they paid to set bladder just to jump up the line <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> only messing around there <laughs> all right well uh, of course panama uh, if we ever look at uh, their squad uh, i love this guy Pinedo, the goalkeeper there's just something about him i don't know i just i really like him also uh, in defense uh, philippe beloy a very good player and up front uh, perez and garces and uh, they are just lethal again panama another side uh, they can just come at you on the counter attack and kill you well <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to preach tactics to the coaches, but, <laughs> but Panama, Dennis, you're, you, you know, even you can be right every once in a while. I yeah, think, I think if again. they sit back, yeah, a, a broken clock is right twice <laughs> a day. But I think if they sit back, if they stay organized, I think the Panamanian team, and I think the coach is a huge part of it, hmm. I think they can do something. But not if they play a wide open game. I think they've got to sit back, stay organized, counterattack when they can. Do you think uh, Guimaraes will play a similar sort of style with Panama as he did with Costa Rica? No, I think you'll change it. And I think mm. and every coach has to change. You, know, you have to play to your strengths. And you have to yeah. figure that out. First of all, identification. Who's going to be the guy that shows up on the day for me more reliable? What system are we going to play? Can we go through the wings? Can we play through the midfield? I think they have a strong midfield. I really do yeah. uh, with Panama. And I think they have a, a good situation of not only ball circulation, but they, they like to get wide play. And if they get wide play and they're not shut down, then they can create things from the wings. And that's where I think Panama will have their strengths. Now, where's um, Tejada gone, the guy that was the MVP from 2005? Or he's, he's like falling off the face of the map. He played a couple of games in qualifying and he's not here anymore. Well, we might have him on the show. I mean, <laughs> since we're not really around anymore either. Oh. <laughs> now, were, were you guys surprised uh, to see Panama in the 2005 final and um, just narrowly lose in penalties to the U.S.? Well, uh, John talked about coaches, and coaches really, you know, they control the show. So I think in a, a change in the coaching dictated that in terms of personnel. A again, they do have the talent to do something in this tournament, but, you know, real tough group that they're starting out in. Would it be fair to say that uh, some of these uh, Central American sides or UNCAF sides are, are catching up to the teams of the North, uh, the USA, uh, and also Mexico? Have they made progress? Yes. Um, are they catching up? Are they close? No, I don't think so. Um, I think they're in a position, though, to compete, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they're in a position, and uh, you know, I might eat my words after the end of the show or at the end of the <laughs> tournament, that I just don't think they have the quality throughout the sides is what we're seeing on, like, on a Mexican team or like on a USA side. I think there's certain players individually that can pull off plays. I just don't think that throughout the whole team and the squad and the depth, which is so important throughout a full tournament, they can really compete at that level. If you did get it wrong, then ask Jeff, our producer, to clip it, and then we can play it back to you at the end of the tournament. We go, well, this is what John had to say. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on, Jeff Strauss. <laughs> yeah. Bring it on, son. I don't care. All right. No, fair enough. Um, and uh, with the Panamanian side, do you, uh, with the Panamanian side, I said, do you think they can make the final again this year? No chance. No? No. No, <laughs> shit. I, I, I don't think so. I think we just went back to John's point. Mm. You know, are they there with, with the USA, mm. with Mexico? No. And it's really about depth or lack of depth. I mean, you need a big, you know, pool of players, especially in a tournament like Gold Cup. Uh, and, and I don't think I have that depth. Well, making their fourth consecutive appearance uh, at the Gold Cup, uh, Cuba, uh, only one win to their name. And, and really, I don't know if they've made a lot of progress uh, in recent times. Oh, they haven't actually. And uh, another group that we talk about, you know, the minnows of the tournament, you know, a group that could be a surprising team that, that competes and plays well. Um, that's what they're looking for. I think if they are able to pull off a result here and there, and, mm. and this is a tough group too, and each of the groups are very hard. Um, but if they're able to pull off a result here and there, mm. then maybe they well, should be happy with that. For them, it was just, uh, just the one win against Canada, I think, in 2003. How, how does a side like Cuba uh, get to the next level? Well, we talked about, you know... Better players. <laughs> <laughs> Better coaching. And more players. Yeah. Does it, is it, does yeah. it come down to budget? You know, like I, I, I talked with a, you know, a, a commentator of ours, uh, Fred Young, and he always talks about it's all about budget. Uh, would that be fair to say? Or is it, as you've, as you've mentioned, is it budget and also tactics? Well, it's budget, players. I mean, tactics, that's the last thing you have to worry about. First, you, mm. have, to, you have to have players playing at a club level in an environment where they can really rise to the level of international play. Then you need number of players in your national team pool. Uh, then you need money, 
then you need a mm -hmm. coach, then you need a ground, a grassroots program. And at the end of the day, if you have all that, then you can worry about tactics. For Cuba, they're not there yet. All right, well, we mentioned uh, Anglomar at 41. There is hope for you, John. There is hope for you. Uh, have a look at this guy. The goalkeeper is uh, 43 years age, uh, 43 years of age, Molina. And uh, also Les Tamore. I like him. He's up front. Uh, fantastic player. And uh, the man uh, watching uh, the, the third and fourth place uh, game for the Caribbean Cup tournament uh, is uh, Cervantes. Uh, very, very handy. Little guy. Loves holding the ball up and uh, just lets the defenders clean right through him. And uh, Cuba pick up the free kicks and move on from there. Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, I think <laughs> we just heard you sing. Uh, we don't want to hear that again. <laughs> I like it when I said Les Tamore. Hey, I thought, oh, hey, cool hey, name, man. We don't want to hear that again. Okay, cool. Plus, we've now. Now a couple of older players, now a goalkeeper, so maybe John and I can, can both get back. I do like the little guy up top. I mean, he's, he's a quick player. He, he's a handful to mark. The question is, will he have any support? Mm. Well, the other thing is, hopefully he can get that support from uh, Ramos, uh, Andoni Ramos. He's a good player, mm. too. He's nippy on the ball, very quick and tight in situations. But is he strong enough to hold the ball up? I don't know. But maybe he can be a supportive player for him. For Cuba, is this it? Is the Gold Cup their tournament? That's the, they're pretty much um, sort of on, you know, uh, unknown in the world of football, aren't they? Yeah, well, we were talking about the U.S. being unknown in football as well in 1990. So when we qualified for 1990 World Cup in Italy um, against Trinidad and Tobago, which was a very big, big game and a, a fantastic yeah. memory for, uh, for myself and a lot of players. But, you know, maybe this is uh, through the Gold Cup and, and through situations like that. We always talk about experiences, but also opportunities. And this is an opportunity for Cuba really to come out and maybe say, hey, we're a team that's going to develop and build over the years. And like you said, maybe it's down to budget, players, everything else, the federation itself, how organized they are. Maybe they can become successful five, six years from now. Well, it, it is great to see them, though, uh, make uh, four consecutive appearances at the tournament. Well, to answer your question, I, I really, and John's right, I mean, where was the USA on the international radar screen, you know, 15, mm. 20 years ago uh, until that goal in Trinidad to send the U.S. team uh, to the World Cup. Cuba, yes, this Gold Cup tournament, humongous for them. I mean, you talk about getting to the next level. If they could pull off a surprise and get out of the group stage into the knockout stage, I mean, they've taken a major step. Now, um, overall, for this group, is there anyone that can stop Mexico? I, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. But, but again, uh, and we talked about it before, you can't take that next game for granted. You've got to go out and get the result. Sometimes, and I'm talking about the favored teams, whether it's Mexico or whether it's the U.S., sometimes it's tough to go against a team that's going to bunker down, get 10 behind the ball. You're going to have to find a way to pick them apart and get behind the defense. But having said that, the U.S. has really had Mexico's, um, Mexico in their back pocket in terms of the recent results. I mean, I know mm -hmm. we did lose away to, to Mexico 2-0 at one stage as well. Recently. John, uh, uh, John's got this. I'm with him. He's got mm. this Mexico USA thing. He, I, got, I, I'm, yeah. I'm in getting to the final. Oh, right? So when Mexico is okay. playing right. somebody in the group stage, All right. US okay. is in their group stage, right. you know, they're going to face teams that are going to bunker down, 10 behind the ball, mm -hmm. and say, try and score a goal. Right. You got to go, go do it. Do you have a Mexican shirt in your wardrobe? I'm sorry? Do you have a Mexican shirt in your wardrobe? You know, I you swap shirts, yeah. yeah? Who yeah. did you swap with? Uh, Ramirez. Hey. Yeah, that, yeah, and um, do, are you one of these players that or, or that used to um, mark uh, someone someone uh, just so you could get their shirt at the end? You know, like someone you're not even marking. No, right they over. always have to mark me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll give you my jersey story because mm. I used to I used to save the jerseys of all the great mm -hmm. players that scored against me, mm. and I, I ran out of space on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick's I do collect jerseys, though. I do collect. Jerseys. Yeah, no, I, th I think Definitely. a lot of footballers Those do. Ones. Yeah. Well, uh, next up on Inside the Gold Cup, we look at the coaching factor. Work like a pro. Play like a pro. Tackle tough jobs. Dominate the game. Destroy the competition. Go professional. Choose Makita. At the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, we test athletes in the lab. Because we know they'll be tested on the field. 
Gatorade, the most tested sports drink on the planet. Welcome back to Inside the Gold Cup. Now, we've looked at the USA, we've looked at Mexico, we've looked at Canada, all the former champions of this, the Gold Cup. But outside of those three teams, is there anyone that could come up and possibly steal it? I, I, you know, can there be an upset? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think most people are talking about a final U.S. against Mexico. You, you mentioned Canada. I, you know, I think they're the team that has the best shot of getting to the final. U.S. and Mexico, they're going to be bumps along the road. If I had to pick one team, I love De Rosario on Canada. <laughs> love Stel Terry. I love the way they can defend. I think they have the ability to get forward. So Mexico and the U.S., I think one of them gets knocked off by Canada. All right. What about yourself, John? Oh, well, I, I do like Canada. <laughs> How can you say that? No, I do like Canada, <laughs> and I'll have to say they're a very organized team as well. But Costa Rica, I like very much. And uh, I think they have talent you know, throughout the side. I think that Hernan Medford has got something to prove here. Um, you know, and maybe he won't be successful. I'm not sure. But they do have the players to, to make a difference. Also, you got to talk about Haiti, you know, with all the recent results that they've mm. had. Um, and, and uh, you know, they're just on a flow right now in Panama as well. You know, they were in the final uh, in the last Gold Cup in 2005 against the U.S. And they played well. So, you know, how many players are returning from them? That's going to be important. And if they rise to the occasion. All right. Well, we want to hear from you, my friend. Yeah, you might have some questions for the panel. Obviously, it's okay to ask you anything, gentlemen. Absolutely. Any topics off limits? No, nope. <laughs> nothing okay. at all. Anything that you want to ask the boys, anything you want to ask us here at the panel, you can mail us at awesomeballs.com. Yes, that is the correct email. Mail at awesomeballs.com. And also for all the latest uh, schedule, news, scores, whatever, you name it, www.concacaf.org or the official uh, site of the Gold Cup, www.goldcup.org. All right, well, make sure you tune in tomorrow. For Inside the Gold Cup, uh, where we look at uh, Costa Rica and Canada, and also Guadeloupe and Haiti. We'll see you then. The reproduction, distribution, publication, modification, public display, public performance, or transmission of this broadcast in any manner, in whole or in part, without the express written consent of CONCACAF, is strictly prohibited. <laughs>